In 1947, Major Karl Plagging, a former commander of a Nazi forced labor camp, was tried for his part in the German occupation of Vilnius, during which 100,000 Lithuanian Jews were murdered. To everyone's surprise, a few Jewish survivors of the labor camp came to testify on his behalf. What they revealed was a covert operation set up to save the lives of the last Jews of Vilnius. In modern Vilnius, commuters are oblivious to this low-rent building complex. It was once called HKP, and it's the only Holocaust labor camp in Europe that hasn't been destroyed or turned into a memorial. During the Second World War, hundreds were saved here. Hundreds more were murdered and buried here. Before these old buildings are torn down, a team of scientists, historians, and survivors converge here to revive the story that was almost forgotten. Using the latest non-invasive technologies, basing themselves on survivors' testimonies and sketches, they hope to unearth the mass grave of those who didn't make it and the hiding places of those who did. These old buildings on the outskirts of Vilnius conceal a dark secret. The current residents may very well be living on top of the bones of the previous occupants. They were Jews imprisoned by the Nazis. During the Holocaust, they fought for their lives in the very rooms these people live in today. At the time, one Nazi major called Karl Plage risked his life lying to the Nazi command in order to carry out a daring operation to save the Jews imprisoned here. Their story and Major Plage's actions were largely unknown until Michael Good, an American family doctor, found out that his mother was one of those saved by Major Plage. And so, I just kept on having these questions up into my head, you know, who, who was this Major Plage? Why would a Nazi major be running around and protecting and saving Jews when the rest of the Germans in Vilna were committed to slaughtering them? Dr. Good's ensuing research finally brought to light one of the most remarkable stories of the Holocaust, about a Nazi who decided to save Jews by creating workshops to fix German army vehicles and demanding Jewish workers to labor in them. This vehicle repair shop was different than all of those other places because families, men, women, and children were housed together Plage argued to his superiors that they had to be together to make them more enthusiastic workers so that they would do really good work. So his vision of what this HKP was was more than just a repair shop. For many of these people, this was their permit for life. To really appreciate what Karl Plage did, you need to go to his workshops. For the workers, they were totally without skills. They were shopkeepers, school teachers, accountants, businessmen, and they had absolutely no automotive skills, even though Plage had certified them as being skilled mechanics. But very quickly, they started to learn more and more skills. And before too long, 
they actually were the skilled workers that Plagi claimed them to be. But then the SS wanted to take the women and children and kill them because they were idle. So he made arrangements uh, to set up uh, clothing workshops in the camp and imported sewing machines and put uh, the women and older children to work. On the one hand, you have Plaga trying to keep a Jewish workforce alive. On the other side, you have the SS who are committed to the destruction of all the Jews in this vicinity. So what that represents, the permanent conflict that exists between Plaga in particular and the SS in Vilna who would seek to destroy as many Jews as possible. But Plagi's plan didn't always work. Before HKP is torn down for urban renewal, scientists armed with the latest in archaeological technology are here to identify mass graves. HKP is unique in the history of the Holocaust. It's still in the same form as it was 75 years ago. A killing field where people are still living. So this is the target that we're looking for. This is the original place where this group from July 2nd and July 3rd were basically killed. That's right. According to survivors' testimonies, the Nazis executed hundreds of prisoners on the side of the Western building. The bodies were then hastily buried in shallow pits. And then they moved the bodies from the original killing trench to another place. That's right. After the liberation of Vilnius, the corpses were exhumed and reburied in a mass grave somewhere in the courtyard between the buildings. First thing is, before we start anything, we're going to drone the whole area, right? We've sort of uh, cornered the market on doing really good science in areas where you cannot do traditional archaeology. Non-invasive archaeology means that you can identify locations of where things happened without having to excavate them. First, we'll be taking high-resolution aerial imagery using a drone. So we'll be taking hundreds of photos over the site, putting them together in a composite image with a, with a resolution on the order of one centimeter per pixel. The scientists now discover a patch of grass that looks different from the surrounding vegetation. Here we clearly see this area of stress vegetation. This might indicate that an excavation took place in the area, maybe to dig a mass grave. OK, so 40 meter line. They now deploy ground penetrating radar, or GPR, to see what lies underneath. We're trying to locate a mass burial site. The hypothesis we have here is that bodies were moved here, potentially around this building, placed in here, and then covered up for their final burial. And so what we're doing here is using ground penetrating radar to image into the subsurface. FM radio waves are transmitted from the device into the soil. By measuring how quickly the signals are reflected back to the unit, GPR can reveal figures in the ground that don't look natural. The GPR data will take several days to analyze. Only then will they know if they've located the victims of HKP. Karl Plage was born in Darmstadt, Germany. He grew up here as a German nationalist. There is a tradition in the family to be in the military and to be a very loyal subject to the government and to do one's best for the country. He was old enough to serve in the First World War. He was captured by the British, becomes a POW for three years, sent home in 1920. And then in the 1920s, his family undergo exactly the same privations as most German families do during the German inflation, where their savings were more than likely wiped out. He wanted to be a 
doctor, but he couldn't pay the fee, and therefore he was an engineer. He didn't want to construct things. He wanted to cure people, to help people. He's unusual in the sense that he joins the Nazi party in 1931, which is very early for somebody taking that step. He was convinced that Hitler and his promise to bring peace would be a, a kind of solution. He was also unemployed, and Hitler also promised to bring those thousands and thousands of unemployed back to work. When we get to 1940, he's drafted in to form part of this engineering facility, which ultimately brings him to Vilnius. It was here that he stopped identifying with the Nazis. At the time, the SS was in the process of murdering the 100,000 Jews of Vilnius. Karl Plage was horrified by the atrocities committed by his people and their local Lithuanian helpers. He decided that he must do something to help the Jews. As he wrote, I decided to work against the Nazis. I saw unbelievable things. I was ashamed. So we came here in September of 43. Dr. Good now invites Sidney Handler to join him at the site. Sidney is 84 years old. He was nine when he moved into HKP. Some parts of these buildings haven't been explored since 1944. We, we lived around here someplace. Yeah. So I was nine, and there were, there were other children in the camp. Were you aware that there were any other children who survived? No, I had no knowledge of that. See the hallways, Michael? Yeah. It's exactly what we had before. Let's try a door here. Maybe we can see one of these. OK. It doesn't look like anybody's home. Let's see if we can get in here, Michael. Hi. Trust here. Can, maybe we come in? Можно, Спасибо. This was it, Michael. This was it. Huh? About four families here. Four families. Four families. And how were, did they Eight have... people. They had bunk beds. Bunk and beds. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, huh. it was all tiny, tiny. Do you know what happened here during the war? Ну знаю, что здесь это самое, где людей закрывали, что были евреи здесь были, ты похоронен здесь. To find evidence of the execution pits, the scientists now deploy another scanning technology known as electrical resistivity tomography, or ERT. So this box connected to our array of 81 electrodes will measure the resistivity of the ground along the entire length of 40 meters to a depth of six or seven meters. The control unit, powered by an electrical car battery, fires hundreds of electrical pulses through the metal spikes into the ground. It measures the way soil conducts electricity and creates a map distinguishing natural soil and man-made disturbances like killing pits. There is an eyewitness testimony that there was a, a trench that was dug in this general area behind this building here. And we want to see evidence of that trench. So we want to see where the ground was dug into and where it was backfilled. And we have that information from testimony, and we also have it from the bullet holes at head height behind me and all along the walls of this building. For years, Major Plage worked to make sure no harm befell his Jewish workers. For the most part, he was successful. Plage had really set up a very unusual atmosphere here. He gathered around him a group of officers who were like-minded, and he gave them orders that the civilians should be treated with respect. 
So there was no brutality. There are no tales of Jewish workers being beaten or savaged within the Plage workshops. He went to great efforts to try to get more food because the SS was allowing only starvation rations. He got firewood from them so they didn't freeze to death during these winters. But he actually found doctors so that they wouldn't get disease. I mean, he thought of a lot of details. Plage feared that one day the SS would get the better of him and remove him from his post. To prepare for that moment, he allowed the inmates to build secret spaces called Molinas, in which they would be able to hide and survive. The archaeologists have expanded their work. They're now not only looking for the mass graves, but for the Molinas as well. Paul and Alistair are in one of the apartments on the ground floor, looking for remnants of one of these hiding places. So we're going to use radar to look through the floor inch by inch to see if there's a shaft leading into the molina below. Half a meter. According to survivor's testimony, it was underneath what is now a kitchen. 15 centimeters below the surface here. To see below the floor, they deploy a Conquest 100 concrete imaging device. Using radio waves, it works in the same way as the larger ground penetrating radar. Concrete imaging is used to scan smaller surfaces and provides a detailed view inside walls and floors. So here we have feature that's about, what, 15 inches, 18 inches by, mm. by 18 inches. So on the grid there, that's, that's pretty small. Small, it's opening, but it's big enough. Big enough to get your hips through. Well, we don't have anything that definitively looks like a shaft, but we do have what clearly looks like some square framing big enough for an adult to fit in. It's not to say that this was the entrance to the shaft, but, but it, it could be. The result is not conclusive, but it suggests that there might still be spaces beneath the building that haven't been filled with concrete. It's exactly at this location on the template on the floor. For over two years, Plaga's plan worked. Both he and the Jews of HKP began to believe that the families under his protection would survive. That's when he allowed himself to go on leave to see his family, a decision that would haunt him for the rest of his life. There was a kinder action, a child capture. It actually occurred in all the camps across Lithuania. It was March 27, 1944. Early in the morning, after the men had gone to work, the SS surrounded the camp with Lithuanian SS troops and then began coming into the buildings, yelling, that uh, the children uh, must present themselves uh, for vaccinations. The SS take advantage of Karl Plugger's absence to mount a raid on these premises, on these buildings, to roust out all the children. We knew that the front wasn't going well. And by that time, my father was gone, my father was gone. Everybody was gone. And everybody had lost family here already in the camp. So it was nothing that we didn't expect except the final finish of our lives. The mothers were were just frantic, fighting. Uh, they were being beaten off and smashed with rifles. The SS men took the, the children by their feet and flung them into the truck so that they landed head down and smashed their heads. And they could hear the children crying in pain. My mother and I came down the stairs, and uh, there was a guard up there. There was a guard. Time here, my mother saw the closet open, and uh, she just pushed me in there with a push. 
And I stayed in this closet all day long, including the time some German soldier came by here and shoved a bayonet into that closet. Bayonet went right by me, and I was so scared. I didn't utter a word. I defecated my pants. My father used to go out to work every morning. And that morning, when the kinder action was on, he didn't go out to work. He had a feeling that he has to stay home and take care of me. And he hit me on the top of the roof. Yadana Shanach Nelo Nisher Bachayim. Bachat Tiani, Imamavet, Koev, Ulo Koev. זו הייתה דאגה. הכלל הראשון היה, כמו שדיברנו, לך תתחבא. ואנחנו, בזכותה של אימא כמובן, מתחבאים בתוך אותו בור. הבור הזה, באותו שלב, מציל אותנו, אנחנו בפנים, ולא יודעים מה קורה בחוץ. And I held myself up on the entrance of the of the of the roof. And I sat on the roof when the oxy was going on, when they were ta taking the children to be killed. And I was saved on top of the roof, and I laid there from the morning till the evening. And the door stayed open and I heard. Every child that came down the stairs, every mother that came down the stairs, I heard, I heard them, I heard them. And that's all I remember, is the mothers crying, 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 because the kids were taken away from them. שירותים, דברים כאלה, שאנשים בלחץ, בשלשולים, זה, זה קורה לנו. הנר שנתן את האור בתוך הבור, הנר, הוא דואך, הוא דואך, הוא לא, אין לו חמצן, הלהבה היא קטנה קטנה. נושמים נש, נשימות כלב. ובסופו של דבר אנחנו פותחים את המקום, האוויר נכנס ואנחנו מאושרים, ואז לומדים את הדבר הנורא הזה שלקחו רק ילדים וכ-200 ילד לקחו. The women were wailing and crying and weeping. The survivors described this horrible cry emanating from the camp that you could hear from every corner of the neighborhood. And uh, this crying went on for days and days. This traumatic event was so horrific that the parents were just unable just unable to bring themselves to get up and come to work. And I think that these women wouldn't have cared if the SS threatened to shoot them. They just, they just could not go on. And so for three days after March 27th, the workshops were empty. In the evening, when the Germans already left, I, I, I went down. My father came up to, 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 to take me. And um, my father looked for a place to hit me. So they, they, they wouldn't take me away. After the kinder action, any child who remained had to be hidden from view. They couldn't let them be seen by any Germans uh, because there were supposed to be no children in the camp anymore. <laughs> הם, הם בסכנה, זה הגבול התחתון. זה דבר שני שהוא קורה, ובאותו רגע, ילדים כמוני, אנחנו כבר לא לגאלים.
Karl Blacke felt guilty that he was in Darmstadt at the time when the Kinderaktion took place there. And he thought that if he had been there, he could have done something. He did not know what, but he thought he could have done something. Plage returned to HKP, where the situation continued to unravel. With the SS gaining ground, it was apparent that the Molinas would be the last resort for the Jews of HKP. Paul and Alistair continue to search for these hiding places. This time, they are looking in the basement underneath the old buildings. There are lots of old newspapers. Using a micro CA-25 inspection camera, commonly called plumber's camera, Paul can see through cracks in the basement walls. Anything behind the walls? Uh, not yet. It's pretty uh, constant temperatures. Alistair uses a thermal imaging camera in an attempt to detect voids behind the walls. If there is a Molina in there, it will show up as a different color on the device. Yeah, I, got a, I got a gap in the wall here, Paul. Yeah, it drops a couple of degrees. Look, look at that. Oh, it's a bolt. It's a bolt just sitting on the floor, but that's um, brickwork in there. I think this is the real thing, actually. Yeah. Yes, I think there's a whole other room back there. Seriously, look. It keeps going way back, and you can see brickwork and... Yeah. So this is really interesting. There's no entrance into this room. Oh, so I think we found a marina. I can't believe I'm going up to the attic. I have been here. I have not been here since 44. The beginning of the end started on July 1st. The Soviets were coming in, and it was clear that the battle for Vilnius was going to take place. And the Nazis had to leave as little evidence of what happened here. The SS tightened the guards around the camp. And at a certain point, none of the men were allowed to leave the camp to go to work anymore. Everybody was just trapped in the camp. So they knew that they were penned up you know, like animals awaiting slaughter. In the end, with Germany losing the war, with the front coming closer and closer, whatever efforts Plugger has put into this environment and into this site are going to be lost anyway. All he can hope for is that some of the people that are still sheltering in these buildings somehow find a way to stay out of the hands of the SS for long enough to be liberated by the Red Army. Under the watchful eye of the SS, Plage now told the inmates that he was being sent away and that the SS was going to take over the camp. And he says, well, we had wanted to take you, our very skilled workers, with us, but unfortunately, this is not possible. But you shouldn't worry, because you too will be evacuated, and during your relocation, you will be escorted by the SS which, as you know, is an organization devoted to the protection of refugees. When the Jews heard this, they understood the coded message. The SS was coming for them on Monday, and the time to go into hiding was now. About half of the 1,000 prisoners that were left went into their hiding places. The other half showed up for roll call, hoping the SS wouldn't murder them with the Red Army about to roll into Vilna. But everyone who showed up was executed in the Panara Forest, where the Nazis were in the process of murdering the last of the 100,000 Jews of Vilna. Now 500 prisoners were missing, and so the SS began to search and tear apart the camp looking for their missing Jews so they could murder them. Michael, it hasn't changed in 73 years. So where were you guys hiding? We were hiding underneath the floor. 
So there are floorboards. There are floorboards floor here. Okay. Okay. And there was a space under the floorboards. And there was a space that was cut out. It was about this height. And we just lay there. The door was open. When we heard anybody coming up here, we would just lift up the boards and put them over us. Other than that, we just lay there and lay there and lay there for days. Huh. <laughs> באמת, המצאנו את זה. ההורים לא האמינו שצריכים לסחב אחרי הילדים. למה היה מושג אחר? אולי פה, אולי שם. אבל בזכותנו גם כולנו ניצלנו, גם הם. אנחנו היינו שבעה, והתחברו שם עוד עשרים איש, תשע עשרה עשרים איש נוספים. ואנחנו ככה היינו בפנים שלושה ימים. In the attic, it was hot as hell. It must have been 110, 145 degrees here. Every minute that we could uncover the boards, we would, because just to get the fresh air. What could you hear? What was going on here? Oh, we, we could hear everything that was going on downstairs. Don't forget, the door was open. We could hear people speaking. We could hear what was going on in the courtyard. Mostly what we heard in the courtyard was the machine gun being fired constantly. It sounds like as they discovered people in their hiding places, they would, they would, march hull, them. They would hull them out. That's all we could hear was crying, screaming, machine gun, silence. We heard somebody running up the steps. The guy ran up. We had no idea who it was. Looked out the window, and he got a bullet hole right in his head, dropped down right here. We heard again the steps. Now, now the, these were boots running up the stairs. We covered up the thing again, the, the, the wood. And we, we could see it was a German soldier. And we could see the guy's boots. Came up, ran up there, looked at the body, looked around, nobody else was here left. We could smell the body for days afterwards. After a I remember this, excuse my language, I remember these fucking stairs every day. Every fucking day I remember these stairs. I'm in the car alone, I think about it. I'm in the shower, I think about it. It just goes on and on and on and on. There's no closure. That's, that's a uh, word invented by people that never experienced bad times. <sighs> the Russians came in. We, we were in the shock. I mean, absolutely in the shock. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know where to turn, what to do. Just shock. When the Jews did emerge, they found that there was a trench that was filled with dead bodies and had a very thin layer of dirt on them. 
but you could actually see arms and legs sticking out and people could recognize some of their friends and relatives in that trench. And then there were bodies and corpses just strewn throughout the courtyard. The Germans didn't have enough time to dig a deep grave. So after the Russians came in, we came back here to rebury them. The bodies were swollen already, I mean, from the, from the heat, pulled them out, dug a deeper grave, and pulled them back in. I was 10 years old. I've seen more dead people than, than you can imagine. Michael now gets his son Jonathan to join him. Maybe they can find the actual hiding place of Michael's mother, Pearl. Armed with homemade sketches based on the memory of family members, they now embark on their own personal search. This is building number two. Yeah, the memoirs say that grandma's apartment was on the first floor, which for Europeans means the first floor above, above the, ground. the ground floor. So if we want to find mom's Molina entrance. That's underneath the staircase. That's under the stairs. Well, let's go find the staircase. All right, this is all new down here. That's not new. Holy shit. Looks like there's a light switch here. All right. Watch your step, Johnny. Thank you, Bob. Okay. All right. Now let's try to figure out what's going on here. So... Well, I mean, it might have been this if this, if this pipe wasn't here. This could be it. This is like a space. So according to the drawing, this wall was solid. Read to me what Grandpa had to say. Working diligently, we blocked off the farthest room in the basement by a brick wall and excavated an underground passage to gain access to this isolated space. For this, we had to chisel a large hole through the stone foundation of the house. So, well, is it hollow? Let's see. Listen to that. Yeah? This could be where the hole was that extended down under the foundation and into this space. So let's go take a walk and see what we find down here. Indiana Jones and Son. Huh. So this whole space in here must have been the Molina. Keep the light right there. Okay. Move the light. Oh yeah, yeah, that's totally it. Okay. So if we imagine that this is a solid wall, I mean, how was an SS man going to ever get in there? Right. So the key was the trap door. Yeah, this is a good target. We could do a small localized radar survey to see if remnants of the shaft are still there. And going through this hole to the other side. OK, I think these pipes seem to carry through to the next room. We're using ground penetrating radar. We use FM radio waves or electromagnetic uh, waves, just like we have on our radios, to look into the ground. Using a plumber's inspection camera to poke into all the little cracks and spaces and behind bricks and through debris to see what might be there, what we might find. It's 
So what we're seeing is a cut coming through here. If layering does not connect up or gets broken, we can indicate that something human has caused that in those areas. Based on the descriptions, this would be that site. It would match up to those descriptions of having a shaft or a hole at the site. Wow, looks like a old shoe. Feels like a wooden shoe, but it's a, it's a shoe mold. Huh. Wow, what's that? It's a wagon, and it is so primitive. Looks like scrap pieces of wood punched out of uh, maybe for some piping that, that some kid pulled together, a rusty nail for an axle, some copper wire to bind it together, and the wheels still spin. This is definitely something a kid stuck in a hole for a few days would have taken with him. This is really a significant find. It really speaks to a very specific time period when people were making these types of carts for children to play with in a very specific place inside the Molina and it may be that it was actually constructed in this place where they had workshops. We have very little of the types of things that we call toys for children who would play during the Holocaust. Their toys tell us more about their lives than any of the other uh, bigger issues that we find at these sites. So this is it, Jonathan. This is... Uh... This is where they hid. They had originally planned to have about 35 people hiding in this space, but desperate neighbors and people looking for a hiding place forced their way in, and there were a hundred people packed into these footings. They couldn't breathe, people were hallucinating, uh, people were attacking each other. It was just this horrible scene. So in the end, when the Russian army liberated Vilna from the Germans and occupied the town. About 250 Jews emerged from their hiding places in this building, and they represent the single largest group of survivors of the Holocaust in Vilna. I mean, just think, Jonathan, this hole that they managed to find and secure is what allowed us to live. After days of data analysis, the scientists conclude their investigation and the search for the mass graves. They've combined the results from different scans and incorporated them into one 3D map of the area. First, they address the findings at the Western Building, where executions reportedly took place, along with temporary burials and shallow pits. Incredibly, science confirms the oral history we investigated where there were rumored to be two pits where people were either lined up and shot into these pits or dead bodies were dragged into these pits. Here is the color tomography model. We can see the dark red areas here are where you have the natural sand. But we can see where that sand has been cut into to a depth of about two and a half to three meters. So we have two distinct pits here. We have one that's about 15 meters long here and another one about 10 meters long here. We also have evidence that there are bullet holes there. Alistair now addresses the ground penetrating radar results in the courtyard where they were searching for the mass grave. In the area between the buildings, we see the same features that we saw on building two. And that is the sand has been cut into, it's been backfilled with some other material. In the same location, we have anecdotal evidence of bones that were uncovered during um, the installation of the heating pipes 15 years ago. Combine those two pieces of information, we think we are looking at a mass grave. It's highly likely that there are still bodies in that area. Karl Plager came back to a totally destroyed in Darmstadt. 
And he was quite sure that everybody died in Vilnius. And that was really on his, uh, on his mind and on his conscience. After the war, Plage was tried as an accomplice in war crimes. He didn't defend himself, but some Jewish survivors of HKP came forward to testify on his behalf. As a result, he was acquitted. But unlike others, he did not feel absolved from guilt. Karl Plage sich gewehrt hat, freigesprochen zu werden, weil er sich nicht unschuldig fühlte. Ich habe auch noch mitbekommen, dass meine Eltern den Kopf geschüttelt haben, dass er nicht auf Freispruch äh, akzeptiert hat. Plage never spoke about what happened during the war and he never spoke about what he did. He thought it was his duty and he didn't do it well enough because so many died. Conrad commemorates his godfather who went to his grave never knowing that he had saved hundreds. Karl Blacke ist kein Held. Das war, das ich auch selbst nie gesehen. Karl Blacke ist ein Mensch, der in einer schwierigen Situation bewiesen hat, was Menschsein heißt. We are always told that a single ordinary man cannot make any difference. And of course that is true if you see it from the global perspective. But it is also true that a single person can make a big difference as my grand uncle Karl Plage did when he saved here the life of over 250 people. Investigators and survivors now commemorate the hundreds buried here. I want to thank my mother, who guided me the whole life through. My mother got me into Hakape, which was a lifesaver. She saved me during the kinder -Akte. She saved me after the kinder -Akte. She carried me down the stairs over here on the shoulders. Then she got me out of Vilna, and then we went to the United States. My mother survived, and I survived. My father and brother, other members of the family, no. Very mixed emotion come here after 70 odd years. And uh, I can't say I'm glad to be here, but I'm, I'm glad I came. So thank you, Ma, for everything. <laughs>